Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Kulik, and thanks for attending my talk on accessibility diary research insights for academia and industry. So just to kind of kick things off, um, a lot of you might not be aware of who I am, especially as I came all the way from England to be here. Um, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of York. I, I have a focus on understanding the experiences of game developers and the kind of challenges and barriers towards making accessible games. I'm supervised by Paul Cairns and Jen Beeston, who are members of staff at the University of York. Uh, and I was previously a games user researcher at Player Research, uh, first in Brighton and also in Montreal, where I had the opportunity to contribute to various titles such as Life is Strange 2, uh, FIFA, and Surviving Mars. Uh, I also have a background in psychology and clinical neuropsychology as well. So this talk will be going over kind of my diary study, which was with people with disabilities. Uh, I'll be kind of talking you through my motivations for this research, both my personal motivations and kind of from the literature and from uh, our knowledge about kind of game accessibility, how the research was motivated. Uh, and then I'll be going on to talk about my approach to the research, kind of what methods we used, and then going on to talk about the results, which is split into terms of talking about kind of how it was navigated for industry and how it was also prepared for kind of the academic audience as well and then talking about uh, the conclusions of this research and the kind of implications as well as some future kind of ideas as well. So some of the highlights or kind of things that might be valuable for you to take away from this talk. Uh, one is focused on understanding the value of diary methods and more naturalistic investigations of the player experience and the value of this kind of research. Uh, another is uh, the value of retrospective analysis, looking at games that you've kind of released in the past rather than just the kind of games you're currently working on or the games you're kind of making in the future. Um, the other obviously is centered on the player experience with people with disabilities, how they're experiencing games, um, as well as kind of strategies for conducting research for two different audiences. So obviously this research was as part of my PhD, so I had the academic audience, then as well as that, I had this industry audience as well. So I'll be talking about kind of how I navigated those two different sets of requirements to produce insight for both. Um, in terms of the experience of people with disabilities, we're talking about kind of why players sometimes continue, why they adapt, and sometimes they, they cease play, um, and the implications on how we might this, this might affect the design of games as well. So starting off with kind of my motivations. So my personal motivations for this research. So fundamentally, I start with the belief that, you know, everyone should have an opportunity to access leisure activities like leisure as well as everything else is an important aspect of our lives. So as a result, games are important to be accessible. It's important that games are accessible to everyone, ideally. Uh, I'm also aware that my first exposure to games and kind of how I, I guess, got pushed along a path or became interested in, along a path of like games user research and just playing games and things like that as a child as well was because I was exposed to games in this hospital setting. Um, I had and well, nothing serious, but I had an appendicitis. So I was in a hospital setting for seven days where I had the opportunity to play games for seven days, basically, because they were accessible to me. Whereas other children on the hospital ward, you know, some of them had broken arms and things like that. Other ones had, had were fatigued and things like that. So it was an opportunity that was accessible to me, which led to all these kind of like opportunities and things like that. And pushed my career in a certain direction, which has pushed my life in a certain direction that wasn't necessarily enabled for other people because the games weren't necessarily accessible. They required a lot of like motor dexterity and a lot of physical demands as well. So <clears throat> I also have my own personal experiences of disabil with disability as well. So I have dyslexia, uh, dyspraxia, and some motor issues. Um, I have scoliosis with uh, like chronic pain as well. So I have my own experiences with disability in certain contexts, less so in games, but it's still something that's valuable to draw upon in other environments. Um, in fact, it, for, for me personally, games has been an area where I actually feel a bit more enabled. So it's been a more of an escape for me, but that in itself is, is valuable. And, and that is the value of like accessibility or one of the avenues of the value of accessibility anyway. Um, Previously, I was also working in a kind of a games services company where we would see lots of different games and we'd also see lots of different games that were potentially inaccessible or had different accessibility issues. So personally, seeing those games, I was wondering kind of, well, why is this happening? Well, why do we see studios like outputting games that are consistently inaccessible in some cases? Obviously, we've seen improvements recently as well. And 
I also saw the PhD as an opportunity to study uh, kind of game accessibility, where there are otherwise very few opportunities to study and specialize in game accessibility. So we'll also talk about kind of the state of accessibility in industry, because this kind of motivates some of the research as well. On this slide, there are some images along the right hand side, which I'll talk about as well. So we have uh, The Last of Us Part Two at the top right of the slide, which has this kind of like high contrast mode showing off uh, one of the kind of visual accessibility options. And this is kind of an indication of kind of how accessibility has moved forward. We have lots of games with more, um, I guess, like cutting edge accessibility features nowadays. We have lots of games with uh, an improved array of accessibility features. Last of Us Part Two is probably one of the best examples of a game with an abundance of accessibility features. Um, we also have a screenshot of the PlayStation Access Controller, which is a special piece of hardware which enables you to kind of plug in various different devices. It's not available for purchase yet, but it's, it's another example of kind of how accessibility is improving in the industry. Obviously, before this, we had the Microsoft Accessibility Controller. However, at the same time, as well as all these advancements in accessibility, we also have many studios who are outputting things which are either less accessible or in some cases not very accessible at all. We have a screenshot here from, I think it's Tiny Tina's Wonderland, which is, it has a UI which is very hard to read, which doesn't have a lot of UI scaling options and things like that. I think there, is, there are some accessibility reviews which are not so great for that particular game. Um, and there are quite regularly games released which, which really don't have amazing accessibility options. I, I played uh, Marvel Midnight Suns recently, which has almost no accessibility options at all. So it's definitely still an issue that many studios and, and kind of many different development environments are still kind of struggling with. So it's still something we need to put a lot more work into, I think. And then there's a little screenshot here of Nintendo Switch controllers as well. And Nintendo, obviously, they have uh, very accessible games in some regards, especially in terms of like, you know, games like Pokemon, they're fairly simplistic. They don't really require quick time reactions or anything like that. But at the same time, many of Nintendo's games use motion controls and things like that too, and they don't support common accessibility features like full custom software level button remapping for each game and things like that either. So we're still not there yet, essentially, is the idea. And in the terms of the state of accessibility research, much of the research in the academic space thus far has focused on providing kind of design solutions and solutions to accessibility problems. So historically, there's been research into things like university, but universally accessible games. There's also been uh, research into like specific solutions to for groups of people. So there are uh, research papers that look into kind of how blind people might navigate in virtual environments, things like that as well. There's also guidelines and research around these guidelines as well. So there's things like game accessibility guidelines and research around that, um, which seeks to kind of provide guidance on how desi designers solve accessibility problems. And then there's also uh, the development of like physical accessibility tools and kind of solving those problems in those places too. So lots of kind of like practical problem solving in the academic space as well, which is definitely valuable. However, there is much less uh, focus on one understanding the experience of the players with disabilities in that space. And there's much less focus also of you know, it, developers that are making these games, there's less focus on understanding the experience of game developers that are making these games and the challenges that they are encountering towards making increasingly accessible games. So a smaller, but very valuable body of literature has focused on understanding how people with disabilities are engaging with games as a medium. Um, one of my kind of co-supervisors, uh, Jen Beeson, has published some research that was indicating that people with disabilities are actively engaging with, with games where they can, and they're using various accessibility features to do so. So, so they're you know, part of the gaming community and they want to engage with games where possible. Um, However, to, to our knowledge, there are there's no like longitudinal study of the experiences of people with disabilities playing games. So as well as this, we kind of have some context for my previous research as well. So my first study as part of my PhD was interviewing game developers. And just an overview of some of these findings, I can always uh, send this paper to anyone on request. But we, I found that developers were uh, very motivated to, to make accessible games, or they felt very motivated to make motivated to make accessible games, but they felt that they lacked lived experience to do so. They lacked the knowledge on kind of solving accessibility problems and kind of how their game would be experienced by someone with disabilities. Um, we also find that developers felt that organizational buy-in was critical. So in order for them to kind of tackle these problems, they required their organization to kind of give them time and resources to be able to do so. And without that, it would be very challenging to make accessible games. They were aware of a wide array of external resources. However, depending on how, well, whether they were being used or not would depend on that organizational buy-in. 
So <clears throat> there's lots of kind of valuable things happening in the kind of game accessibility space in both uh, academia and industry. Um, but there are also lots of avenues for kind of potential improvement of developers uh, for our knowledge of how developers experience kind of game development, um, accessible game development, and how people with disabilities are experiencing these games. Um, so in academia, natural player experiences of people with disabilities have seen very limited attention. So that was really the focus of this diary research and kind of what led to our, to our research questions. So that's the kind of gap in the literature that, that my study here was, was kind of seeking to fill. So the research question this led us to was what are the natural play experiences of people with disabilities? What motive and the subordinate questions to that really are what motivates uh, people to continue play or to cease play? Um, what are the difficulties and frustrations they experience during natural play? How do they react when encountering accessibility issues and how do these reactions affect ongoing play? So those are kind of our key research questions as part of this study. Approach. But here I'll be talking about the kind of diary methods. So why diary methods? So the idea of using diary methods really was that it gets at this heart of this natural play experience. And I think this is actually best described in the words of one of my participants who said, that I love to participate in one in these kinds of studies where I'm testing a game in my natural play experience and my natural environment where I'm most comfortable. So I think, and this comes up as one of the themes in my study as well, this idea of comfort and being able to play in the environment where you're most comfortable, where you feel most naturally able to use the thing, the devices that you use at home and things like that. This is what the players found most comfortable. And there's a lot of reasons to believe that that would affect their behavior as well. When you're playing naturally, when you're playing comfortably, when you're playing in the way that you are familiar with, it's likely to change how you're experiencing the game. So that's what I really wanted to get at and why I really chose to use kind of like an at-home diary study uh, method rather than um, like a traditional formative usability testing or anything like that. Um, diary methods also help us understand how the experience might change over time. So one of the things I was interested in um, going back to the research questions was how players might be adapting when they encounter accessibility issues. They, are they just quitting immediately or, or what are they doing? Uh, and this enables us to see some of that as well, because we can see how they check their behavior changes from session to session, or if they do choose to cease play and things like that too. Um, and like I say, uh, observing a phenomenon that might not naturally occur in formative play testing. So going into a lab, which is especially unsuitable for, for accessibility studies in many cases, because there are various logistical difficulties with getting people into a lab and testing in those environments in ways that might be uncomfortable too. So based on all of that, um, we organize recruitment through the Able Gamers Charity, who have like a player panel of uh, groups of people with disabilities. And we recruit appeal based on having a natural interest in playing Gears Tactics. So the idea of this was that it would be something that they were already interested in playing anyway. So uh, obviously it wouldn't be especially natural of a study in a home environment if it was I was getting to play a game that they didn't want to play. So I recruited people who, for instance, had played the Gears of War franchise and, and were thinking about playing Gears of War Tactics, but hadn't got around to it yet and said, hey, would you like to play this game and, and kind of chat to me about it? Um, and these players identify as having some degree of disability as well. In addition to that, Obviously, Gears Tactics is, is a violent game, so we recruited people based on the age rating of the game, so it's 18 plus, and therefore our participants were 18 plus as well. Why Gears Tactics specifically? So there was a desire to use a mainstream off-the-shelf game. I mean, a, a mainstream game because we want it to have as, as much kind of, I guess, like validity as possible. We want this research to, and its findings to have as much validity as possible. So we want to kind of have, look at a game that people are playing in the, their day-to-day -day in the real world. Um, and we also wanted to produce findings that would be, that would reach an audience that was potentially beyond academic. So the other aspect to it as well was I had, uh, some communication with people that worked at the studio that made the game already, and they were interested in kind of learning more about how people with disabilities were experiencing their game. So I knew that there was a pathway to, as well as producing this academic research, feed things back to industry and help them materially improve the accessibility of their game. So that was the avenue that I thought was valuable as well when designing this study. I could have obviously just picked something like Call of Duty off the shelf and studied that instead, but I didn't have that contact with people at that studio that were interested in improving accessibility. So I kind of wanted to have that dual impact. So in terms of the research process, so I recruited uh, 10 participants, which featured in the study, eight with disabilities and two without. They played the game for the first session, followed by an initial interview. And they were left to play for one month 
and completed diary entries with each play session so that within that month-long period they could play the game whenever they wanted which which kind of goes back to this idea of it being like a natural play experience they were able to play whenever they fancied if they you know if they didn't have the energy to play one day or didn't even have the energy to play for one week that was fine i didn't have to tell them they had any play expectations i told them that they could cease playing the game anytime they wanted if they, if they felt naturally that they wanted to quit then they should do that and they should do what they, they felt was natural to them um the only uh i guess structure to it really was that the very first session I interviewed them immediately after the very first session, um, just to capture their initial thoughts on that as quickly as possible and kind of debrief them on kind of what we'd be doing for the rest of the month long study. So interviews were at the very start and then every two weeks. So I had an interview at the initial um, point of contact with the study and then two weeks in and at the end, at the end of the month for a total of three interviews. So the interviews were focused on the play experiences surrounding Gears of War tactics. They were informed by the, the diary entries as well. So the, the aim of the diary entries really was to kind of help ensure that these interviews were capturing everything that the players were experiencing. So, you know, they might have five sessions between these two interview periods. And on two of their sessions, they might say, oh, there was something really um, frustrating that happened here or something really positive that happened here. And then I would feed that into the interview to kind of make sure that we were capturing everything. And I'd say, oh, you mentioned that you were really frustrated on level four, can you, can you talk to me about that? So the, the idea of the diary entries was really kind of making sure that everything was captured down so it could be um, talked about and discussed properly in the, the interviews. Um, some of the focus was on accessibility and usability issues, but also the overall player experience too. So I wanted to know kind of whether players were enjoying the game. And we talked about motivations at the start. So I was, I was looking at kind of what, how they were engaging with the game, whether the game felt engaging and things like that as well. Um, Interviews were transcribed and analyzed using reflexive semantic analysis. Uh, you can read more on reflexive semantic analysis uh, at Brown and Clark, or you can um, ask me about it at any point. I've used the method a few times as well. So, um, the, This method in particular emphasizes the researcher as kind of an active participant and this idea, the process of analysis as a kind of co-construction of meaning between the participants and the researcher. So it doesn't purport this idea that you are getting to the absolute ground truth of the research, but it does take steps to kind of uh, respond to the kind of what the researcher is putting in, like the, the process of re reflexivity and kind of acknowledging your role in the research process. So why work with an industry partner? This was, I think, a pertinent question to answer as well. So I mentioned this a little bit before, but uh, in terms of why we chose Gears Tactics, but it helps ensure the findings have real, a real world application. So obviously, you know, you get a lot of academic studies who are producing a thing with the anticipation that someone will read it in the future and the anticipation that an industry contact or something like that um, will read it and apply it or something like that in the future. But by working with a, a real world partner in the games industry, enable us to say kind of what are you interested in learning about your game? Um, and how can we align our research to answer kind of the questions in both spaces, which is valuable. Um, it also enabled me to kind of create a relationship which might be valuable for future research. In fact, my kind of follow-up study to this was uh, interviewing some developers at the same studio. So it creates like a research kind of partnership in a way, which is valuable for the academic research and the industry partner too. Um, as a PhD student as well, so I'm coming close to the end of my PhD, it helps me keep my skills in touch with what the, the industry want from um, an academic moving to industry as well. So there is, I guess, this reputation that maybe sometimes academics can become more and more detached with industry and the requirements of industry over time and working with industry partner enabled me to kind of not lose touch with that in some ways. My PhD program, which is called Iggy, also expects an account for some knowledge share system too. So what that means is they account for some time in my PhD schedule for it anyway. So it wasn't like as if it was taking up time that I would need to do like other academic work and writing my thesis and things that was already accounted for in my kind of funding and things already. Cool. So in terms of managing the requirements of industry and academia, obviously they have kind of different requirements. Um, in terms of academia, when we're talking about kind of qualitative research, we're really talking about transferability. We're not really talking about generalizability. So this study and its finding don't, they don't say this is how the whole population of people with disabilities experience. Um, you know, the game, the, the game or games and disability, but they do say, oh, this is you know, some valuable insight in, into how people with disabilities might experience uh, a game, and these might be transferable to other scenarios that are similar. 
Um, it's really focused on in the academic space more on depth of understanding. Um, so kind of especially in terms of the player experience, the, the depth of understanding of their motivations and, and kind of their experience with the game and things like that more broadly. And the focus in particular is on the player experience and the and kind of player and how they're adapting and things like that as well, which in contrast, just on that note in particular, in, in for the industry research, the focus is really on the game as the artifact of study. So we're talking about the game and, and where the design has failed in, in that case and, and where it's, you know, it's demands are too high for the player or something like that. And, and when feeding things back to the developers, we're really talking about the game and its design and where it's where it's not meeting expectations for, for players and their experience, rather than on the academic side, where we're much more focused on the player themselves and their experience with the game. Um, on the academic side, in terms of timelines, we're really talking, I wrote as much time as required here, but my, my supervisors would obviously disagree with that. Um, I it's a, My funding runs out after four years for my PhD study, so there is, there is some practical constraint there as well. But in general, it, it, the idea is to produce the best research possible and take the time that is required to do that. So in this case, this, this study was like over a year long on the academic side. Um, normally, a study like this on the industry side might be much shorter. But acknowledging that also, when managing the requirements, uh, we kind of prepared different research reports for industry. So they were kind of much faster turnaround than the kind of uh, thematic analysis work and, and whatnot that we were doing on the academic side too. The other focus on the industry side really came down to kind of actionability and granularity. So in terms of actionability, we're really talking about specifically what is happening in the game and kind of how, how we can, might be able to solve those problems. Like I wasn't providing developers with specific, this is how you solve these problems, but I was providing developers with concrete uh, explanation of what was happening and starting points for discussion saying, this might be how you start to tackle this issue. This might be one way you start to tackle this issue or have you considered this? And I will show a little bit of that in a few more slides, as well as, as I say, granularity there. So we're talking very specifically kind of what feature is, is not working in, in the player experience quite as well as it perhaps is intended. So in terms of managing those requirements, we kind of split the research into two kind of tracks for the deliverables. So we had this kind of accessibility report, which was the focus of deliverables for the industry audience. So there's an image on the right side here, which kind of shows the two tracks. The long line is talking about the kind of academic research, which was kind of ongoing. But you can see very early on in this, there is another line that comes off the side, which breaks off and starts to indicate there were deliverables being kind of communicated with to industry. So the accessibility report, and I, I talked about that a little bit there, but also the talk, we did talks to developers as well. Uh, we did report updates as well, kind of as, as this thematic analysis was going on and we had updates to findings or we were recruiting more players for the study. I updated the report and just sent them over a brief update um, as well. And we also translated the report's finding in, findings into workshops too, to kind of communicate with developers in different ways. Results. So I'm going to talk about the results in terms of both the accessibility report, so the one that was delivered to industry, uh, and then the kind of thematic analysis work that I was delivering for, I guess, my thesis and academia. So this is similar to, well, the format we use was similar to a usability report format with uh, issues generated based on player reporting of areas of frustration, confusion, barriers to progression, but also interacting with uh, an impairment or a or, accept, or use of accessibility feature, which wasn't really meeting their expectations of it. Um, and they were taken from the kind of first interviews plus diaries. So most of these accessibility issues in particular were occurring based on, on the first interviews. Then the report update was used if anything else was merging later on. Uh, and this was delivered via, via PDF and also a presentation. Uh, I delivered two presentations to the studio on the same thing, um, just to help make sure that it was being delivered to the right teams and things like that. And they were getting the, the insights was, um, going as thoroughly through their organization as, as possible and valuable. Uh, again, it was designed to be granular and actionable. I'll show you some of this report on the next slides anyway. Um, and like I say, later updates were sent. So this is an example of kind of a slide from, from that report. And I'll talk through this a little bit, but in this particular instance, uh, it's, if you are familiar with usability reporting, the structure I used was similar to that for accessibility issues, because I don't in general believe them to be especially different fundamentally. I think uh, accessibility issues are uh, usability issues are experienced as a result of an interaction between 
a difference in ability and the demands of the game that are sometimes more uniquely experienced by people with disabilities. And I guess experienced more severely and more frequently for people with disabilities. However, the mechanisms of them where it comes down to like frustrations and, and barriers to progression and things like that are very similar to how you look at a usability issue. But how we structured this was, again, to focus on the idea of, kind of actionability. Uh, we have a, a kind of priority system talking about kind of how impactful this was. So in this case, it's a high priority thing because it was this particular issue is unclear what to do during tutorial for people with low vision. And the heart of this issue was that a text-to-speech system was inconsistently reading things on screen. And sometimes they would be crucial bits of information telling people to like go to this part of the map and, and complete this particular objective. Um, <clears throat> the title was aimed to be uh, talking about the game as, as the kind of focus of the experience there. So, so in this case, it was the game that was presenting things as unclear. It wasn't the kind of players don't know how to do this or players don't know how to do that. It was the game that's failing the player in this particular way. Uh, and that kind of harkens back to the kind of like social model of disability as well, whereas the, the environment and how that's been built is creating disability rather than people who inherently have disabilities. Um, the issue descriptions are structured in terms of talking about the experience, so kind of how players experience the game, how players experience this issue. Uh, and then I have screenshots there too. In this case, it's a screenshot that has a little um, UI prompt at the top left saying, shoot the hammer burst drone, which is something that wasn't being read by the text speech system. And as you can imagine, if that is a requirement to progress through the tutorial, then it will be difficult to progress if you aren't in some way communicated that piece of information. So another segment of kind of how, writing up the issues was talking about the impact. So as well as explaining the experience that people were having, kind of what was going on in the game and how players were experiencing that, I was also talking about the impact, what effect did this have, both on the short-term and long-term player experience. So in this case, it was likely to lead to players being frustrated. But it was also likely to lead to players being altogether stuck, which in turn might lead to them not knowing what to do to progress and deciding to choose to stop playing the game. <clears throat> so following that, we also um, had suggestions for how you might start tackling this issue too. So as I said, these, these tend to be kind of scaling suggestions. So scaling in terms of implementation difficulty, but also just starting points for consideration rather than this is what you need to do to fix this issue. Because there may be various tech considerations that I'm not aware of, especially as an academic researcher that's not embedded into a team. So I don't have an awareness of the kind of tech pipeline of a product. I don't have awareness of why this element isn't being read already because intuitively, I'm sure that someone had tried to make all of the UI elements read originally. Um, so it's more about asking questions, like what, what can you like explain the issue and then asking what, what can you do potentially to try and solve this? And in this case, that's really thinking for future titles rather than existing ones because this was a, a retrospective analysis towards um, an older game. So that was, uh, that was kind of like the report that was delivered to industry. That included uh, you know, many, many different uh, issues with different prioritizations, as well as like an executive summary in the same way that usability report might have as well, um, which just explained like, I like the accessibility health of the game. Um, and I also had uh, my thematic analysis work that I was kind of producing my thesis and producing for the academic audience. So this was analysis of the interviews, uh, focused on, on, on all of the interviews, so not just the kind of initial play experience, focusing on identify themes rather than individual access issues. Um, but this is difficult to action on a specific game because it tended to be abstracted and talking about the overall player experience rather than talking about a particular feature that was failing in some way. So this is an overview of the kind of themes from that, uh, that resulting analysis. So I'll talk about these very briefly on this study, but go into each of them in quite a bit of detail as well. So we have kind of managing comfort uh, as a theme, seeking enablement, uh, flexible challenge, and being able to uh, connect with the game and plan and strategize and appreciate the design of the game, really. The last one really is more about kind of getting into the game. Once you, once you are comfortable, once you feel enabled, once you feel like you have the level of difficulty is appropriate for you, then you're talking about kind of getting into the game and enjoying it in the way that you, the designers ideally would intend. So in this case, because it's a, a strategy game, it comes down to kind of planning and uh, figuring out strategies. And as well as that, it's just narrative game as well. So you complete a mission and you see story elements that came through in my interviews too, where players were talking about wanting to see what happened next and things like that, and wanting to see what happened to certain characters or the ending of a particular story arc and things. Uh, in addition to that, we also have this kind of, uh, I guess, like cycle of adaptation below. So when these 
needs at the top were dissatisfied, players were looking to realign the experience in some way. So we're talking about kind of how players were either accommodated, adapted, or tolerated the experience in some way, and the different reasons that, or the different kind of factors that might have enabled them to do so, or different reasons that they might have decided to kind of make that decision when talking about tolerance. So I'll talk about each of these in a little bit of detail, but yeah, in terms of comfort, it was something that came through in the interviews. It's, this theme is labeled managing comfort because it wasn't just that they were prioritizing comfort, but sometimes players would also take a comfort trade-off as well. So they were saying, as part of the kind of uh, adapting in certain ways, um, there's an example from a player here where they talked about how, so the text-to-speech system wasn't effective for them, but they knew if they could sit closer because they had low vision, they could still just about perceive what they needed to do. So they would sacrifice comfort and sit closer. And then the caveat to that is that they had to move physically around the screen to be able to perceive everything, which is less comfortable than you'd be playing normally. Um, but it's something that enabled them to continue playing. So they were prioritizing comfort, but they were also kind of managing it throughout the process to, to kind of still enable them to play in some cases. The second one is, is seeking enablement, and which I think seems quite intuitive, but players in the study generally wanted to be able to do and understand everything the game expected them to do. Um, and they felt frustration and dissatisfaction when they reported not understanding something or not being able to do something that was expected of them. Like in this instance, we have a few quotes that talk about, well, one of them talks about trying to use a grenade, but they, they weren't able to do it and they ended up blowing themselves up. Another one uh, talks about not knowing where to go in a game, which I think is a very common issue that uh, comes up in usability kind of studies as well. Flexible challenge talks about this idea of um, it's important for the for the game's level of challenge to be kind of, well, in some cases, it's important for it to be appropriate to the level of ability that a player has. So if you think about flow and things like that, we always talk about the kind of level of difficulty needing to be balanced against the player's ability. However, people also reported to me feeling that they wanted kind of like mood aligned challenge as well. And that's something I've heard from other researchers studying similar things where players talk about kind of, you know, if they want to relax or if, if they have a low mood and things like that, then they might want a lower challenge. So uh, the theme here really is that they're desiring flexible challenge rather than desiring uh, an appropriate difficulty. It's desiring a challenge that they can kind of customize based on various and complex factors. And then being able to appreciate the, the game's design, um, players spoke about aspects of design that they were kind of enjoying in the game. So the, things like being intrigued by the story and wanting to see more, uh, and, and particular kind of strategic mechanics that they were enjoying, kind of enjoying strategizing with and things like that as well. Um, so as I say, this was kind of when the game is comfortable, when it was when players felt enabled, when they felt they were appropriately challenged, then they would start more commonly getting to this point where they were talking about how they enjoyed the mechanics and things like that in the game as well. However, when players were dissatisfied in, in these various areas, they then started to talk about kind of this process of adaptation or tolerance. Um, so players talked about kind of first in general seeking accommodation. So in terms of seeking accommodation, we're talking about seeking accessibility issues in general. Uh, they might not traditionally be seen as accessibility issues. So they might not be nested in an accessibility menu, but they might be things like difficulty options or something like that. Um, and these would be a variety of different things, including subtitles, including custom re remapping, um, including things like the text speech system, which players did try and toggle on and off and experiment with and things like that as well. And failing this, particularly when they weren't able to find accommodations, they talked about kind of making their own adaptations. So going back to that example I used before, that was an example of how a player kind of accommodated physically, well, sorry, adjusted physically um, to ad adapt to, to kind of uh, and realign the demands of the game with, with, with what they're able to do. So in that case, they were trading off a bit of comfort to increase their own ability to meet the game's demands. And it was, it was comfort there that ended up being um, sacrificed. But there are other types, of, um, other types of adaptation as well. So that there would be things like uh, cognitive adaptations where, say, if a player was um, finding it difficult to understand the equipment system or something like that, they would say, well, actually, I, I won't really worry about that system. I, I'll just ignore that system and keep playing. And obviously, you can imagine many games where that might cause an issue, for the most part, because this game was um, more driven by the player's ability and strategic choices. It wasn't that much of an issue if they minimized their investment in some of those other aspects, especially if they were playing on a lower difficulty or something like that anyway. 
um, it was a way that they could kind of minimize the cognitive load in a certain area to kind of adapt and keep going forward. And then, especially when, especially when they, they, you know, they couldn't find an accommodation and they couldn't successfully adapt, then they start thinking about tolerance. And this is kind of like, well, do I want to keep playing? Is it worth it? And the two factors that really came into conversation when talking about is it worth it, one of them was advocacy. And this is always a big theme, I think, when, when speaking with people dis dis with disabilities. I think also it, when speaking with people who are traditionally haven't been especially included in the design of games and things like that, they often see opportunities to be advocates and kind of improve the design of games as being especially valuable and not only to themselves, but they have lots of friends and things like that um, who they want to improve the accessibility for as well. So I had players in my study saying, oh, I, I can't, I can do this thing but my friend can't, so it's a problem, if that makes sense, so, because he wouldn't be able to do it. So that's, that's a problem as well. Um, <clears throat> but in other cases, players would be struggling with a particular issue and they would say, they, they, would, they would keep pushing forward because they say, oh, I want to give you more insight, I want to do this. I did say at the start of the study that I tried to discourage this, the idea it was a natural play experience. And like I said before, you should cease playing whenever you feel that you want to. But I guess in reality, you can't just take away this factor. Like if you, if you kind of want to be an advocate for people with disabilities, if you want to improve accessibility, then that naturally, it's still natural that they want to keep playing and want to keep providing that feedback. So many players would continue because of this advocacy factor as well. And the other factor was that it was compensated by other areas of the game. So this idea here was that, um, you know, players said things like, oh, I really enjoy the story in the game. and I want to see more of it. I really want to see what happens to so-and-so character. I really want to see how the narrative ends and things like that. So when, you know, when they get to this point, when kind of everything really maybe wasn't quite working and they were dissatisfied to quite a significant amount and they couldn't find accommodations, they couldn't adapt, they would, they would still kind of sometimes factor in um, other things as to whether they would keep playing anyway. Failing that, if it, if it was still, you know, they kind of considered tolerating the experience, but they decided that it wasn't worth it. There weren't other aspects of the game that were worthwhile in comparison to the experience they were having. They would sometimes cease play as well. Conclusions. So <clears throat> from this finding, both from, I guess, we'll talk about the conclusions from like the academic perspective, but also the industry perspective as well. On a practical level, just on a very kind of <clears throat> simplistic practical level, the accessibility report helped identify a variety or, or clarify a variety of accessibility issues for the studio. Uh, in some cases, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we thought that was a concern already. In other cases, it was like, oh, that's really interesting. We, we didn't think about that. We hadn't seen that in our player experiences before. Um, another kind of observation was that people with disabilities have similar motivations that seek similar experiences, such as enjoying the narrative and strategy of a game. Like in a game like this, that's what you would expect. It's, it's a strategy game. It's built on planning and, and kind of developing tactics and things like that. And that was the experience of people with disabilities playing in this study too. So they're, they're playing with very similar motivations and it desires from the experience. Um, the other thing is that people with disabilities often want an ability appropriate challenge, but players can also seek play challenges based on their mood. I think there is often maybe sometimes a misconception that people just want to turn a game down to easy mode or something like that. But it's usually the case that players often want an ability appropriate challenge. But the key thing really is just flexibility, like because sometimes it might be the case that players just feel like they, they, they don't have the energy to play on the highest difficulty that day. And especially with um, with the disabilities that were featured in this study too, we had people with various motor disabilities and things like chronic fatigue and things like that too. They would have different moods on different days and things like that as well. So they have different difficulties that they want to play on different times. Um, and sometimes also, something I didn't mention before really, um, was that when they're experimenting with accessibility features and things like that too, and they're not really certain how the experience is going to be for them. Like historically, they've, they've been through many games and bounced off them because of how inaccessible they were. It's sometimes easier for them to put it on the lowest difficulty so they can kind of experiment with the settings and things like that too. Um, accessibility and usability issues seem to be experienced very similar. So I did also have uh, a, a small number of people without disabilities in this study just to kind of compare the experience there too. And they were talking about similar things like prioritizing comfort, prioritizing enablement, very similar language to, to kind of people with disabilities. It's just that their usability issues weren't experienced as a result of a particular difference in ability. They were experienced just because of um, a mismatch between the game, a mismatch between the game's demands and, and their kind of ability levels, but it wasn't a result of any particular impairment or anything like that. Um, access, uh, people make significant uh, efforts to adapt where possible. So I guess one of the things that I would say here is I think this is 
generally true if people are invested in the experience, but in, in my study in particular, people have this desire to be advocates as well. So I wouldn't think that this is always likely to be as strong as an effect. But in general, people do, they definitely do want to play your games and, and kind of keep playing your games. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, they enjoy these games through similar mechanisms, to the, the same mechanisms as anyone else. So they want to keep playing and go as far into it as possible. So it makes sense that they would seek to adapt in the same way that many players do. Um, but without accommodations, then it becomes very difficult. And then they have to start thinking about tolerance. And then there's a certain threshold of what they will tolerate, um, especially if there are, you know, the accessibility barriers in some cases were so severe that, that wasn't possible. So in one case, for instance, I had a player who was completely without sight and they they adapted for a while by um, by playing with like a trial and error type of style. So they would click around and just try and guess at where the, the, the enemy was and they would use different cues in the environment to do that. And they managed to successfully adapt even though they were progressing slower and it was much more difficult for them. But they got to a mission where there was a turn limit on the mission and suddenly they they weren't able to use that adaptation anymore and they had no way of progressing anymore so sometimes it's not even a matter of tolerance it's the accessibility barrier is so severe that there it, it doesn't seem conceivable there's any way to continue play um <clears throat> the other thing i suppose is, is that people with disabilities are, are often strong advocates themselves and other people with similar experiences so i guess there is this wealth of resources um, within um, this community of people that want to kind of participate in this type of research and want to provide feedback and want to contribute to the design of games and make them more accessible. And that's something that we should have involved in the game development process wherever possible. Implications, I think one of the key things that comes from this study is this idea of flexibility. And especially when we're talking about a lot of these, uh, well, a lot of the issues could have been, been solved by just providing different adjustments, different kind of UI sizes, different difficulties, different um, different range of settings for people to kind of engage with, different difficulties as well. Um, and they can often provide solutions for traditional usability issues and accessibility issues as well. So they often make it often results in a better game for everyone to make games that are flexible in various ways. Um, the other thing I would say is that people are varied and complex in their motivations to seek difficulty. So it's not just that people want an appropriate challenge. It often is the case, but it's not always this way. So again, a flexibility, I think, is the key when presenting difficulty. If you want to accommodate as wide an audience as possible, if you want your game to be as accessible as possible, then you need to think about flexibility when you think about difficulty. And we do see a lot of games doing a really good job of that as well now, because we have not only flexibility of the overall difficulty, but granular levels of difficulty as well. So that's what I would recommend in that area um accessibility by design and accessible accessibility options help as well so if we kind of think about the the thematic map and this kind of cycle of kind of adaptation or tolerance uh gears of war tactics gears tactics is a turn-based game so in in some ways that ended made it accessible by design for some players so if they had a motor disability and they're trying to rapidly complete a task in another game then it, it might be the case that well they can't shoot those enemies quickly enough in call of duty or something like that but in gears tactics the, the design this design element made it more accessible but the other thing too is that accessible accessibility options made it so that people didn't have to enter this cycle as well so they didn't have to start looking for the accommodations to kind of re-enter an experience that was satisfying for them they could out of the box if they could out of the box make it that way then that led to a better experience as well um as I mentioned just on the previous slide, really, people with disabilities want to be included in this process. They, they want to be advocates. They really want to be included in this process. So there are plenty of consultants that you can hire that want to be you know, paid to work in games. There are plenty of um, participants that want to be included in your kind of player pools when designing your user research studies as well. So I, I don't see any reason not to kind of involve them as much as possible in the game development process and get that diversity of feedback. There's also a lot of value in retrospective analysis as well. So in this particular case, um, I think if you are if you are a developer that is really wanting to improve your accessibility and you can see that your, your the past library of games you've made, they might be accessible in some ways, like Gears Tactics has a lot of accessibility features, but it's still something that they were looking to improve at quite rapidly. Um, it might not be the case that you have, you're at the point where you've got all the kind of accessibility vision in the game that you, you kind of wanted to have. So running that retrospective analysis and really considering, oh, well, how do people with disability experience the last game we released? If you can't answer that question, then there's really no reason not to be doing research on that game. And especially when you're talking about kind of diary studies and natural player experiences and, and like doing studies in people's homes, being able to take something that's off the shelf already, it has a lot of benefits in that regard as well. That's not to say that you shouldn't be making an effort to 
um, run this this type of research or, or run uh, pieces of research with people with disabilities as well on the kind of the games that are in development. However, it has a lot of benefits and there's, there's some logistical benefits as well to looking at as well as that, that your backlog of games too. In terms of future research, so in terms of future research, I'm thinking kind of how, how does this kind of insight for the games industry, how does it affect the kind of culture and knowledge around accessibility at a particular studio? So this, this knowledge was obviously fed into a particular um, studio, my industry partner. How, how does this um, knowledge affect the uh, thinking around accessibility work? Is it actually impactful in their future products? Is it, is it changing the culture around how they're having conversations about accessibility and, and designing for accessibility? Um, and, and particularly, how can that change be monitored? Like something, one of the conversations I've had with other developers working on accessibility things before is there are there are lots of technical and logistical considerations that might make it harder or easier to be to make an accessible game in different circumstances. Like maybe you have a uh, drastic change in tech, maybe you change engine or something like that. And then maybe the next game is only as accessible as the last one. But at the same time, what you'd expect is if you're being effective, as someone that's injecting accessibility knowledge into the studio, you would still be expecting a cultural change at that studio, even if the accessibility of the last game might not have changed that much from the pre from the one before it. So how can that change be monitored independent of the just the output of accessibility in the games that are being released? Um, yeah, and how, how can our insight into the important facets contributing to accessible game development help us craft accessible processes and organization of work? So kind of how, how can the, the learnings from, from my other research in particular, where I've been studying game developers, how can I use those insights to kind of think about organizational process around the management of accessibility work? And how can we improve that work towards helping studios make more accessible games and improving that culture? And then ideally potentially measuring it as well. Cool. And thank you very much for um, being present for my talk. Uh, my name, sorry, my my contact address is, my email's on the slides, joe.kulik at york.ac.uk. I'm also available on LinkedIn at Joseph Kulik as well. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me now, and I'm happy to feel anything about either of the kind of pieces of work on this. Yeah. Thank you. I will. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that was actually one of the reasons that I designed it to be this kind of like hybrid diary study where a lot of the kind of, oh, sorry, repeat the question. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so Diary studies um, are often traditionally very demanding in terms of like what they expect from, from participants. Uh, was there any kind of accommodations and considerations around that in terms of how I designed the research? Uh, and yes, absolutely, uh, as, as answered that. Like I, so one of the reasons I designed it as like this hybrid diary interview studies where you had these diary entry um, forms and you also had the interviews was so to offload a lot of the kind of information that they'd need to provide from the, the diary entries every single time they played the game. So the, the diary entries were included some Likert scale information about kind of how they experienced that session, including frustration and things like that. And only one or two, I think two open text entries just to provide any information if they wanted to about that session, about moments they felt were kind of remarkable or frustrating in a particular way or anything like that. Moments they think they'd want to talk about later, basically. Um, and then the interviews went into a lot more detail. So I tried to minimize how long they would spend um, entering those forms basically into something that would only take around five or six minutes each time. Um, players did occasionally still forget to do the form though, and then they would openly tell me to do that. And that wasn't anything that I could uh, easily do to, to avoid that. But players did mostly complete the diary forms. And if not, they were usually able to remember what they kind of engaged with. Does that answer the question? Does anyone else have a question? Yeah. Um, so I'm in academia. I'm curious whether working with an industry partner meant that you had more resources. Like, were they able to help you pay participants, or was it more of a just mutually beneficial thing? Um, yeah, I, I suppose it was more of a like in terms of like 
payment and, and resource like that. I have resources from my academic, um, like uh, there's like a bursary for, for running research and it would never come, this type of study wouldn't be an issue with, with doing it in that scope anyway. Um, it was more resources and that they did provide access to the game because obviously I was providing people with access to the game. So I also um, contacted um, Microsoft as well, who like who own Gears Tactics because they own Gears of War. So they provided keys to Gears Tactics. Um, but they also provided lots of insight in terms of like I, I suppose like what they wanted to know from the say so in terms of what I what I was like how I was building a report for them and things like that as well, which I think was useful. And also it helped me understand kind of what skills and things like that I should focus on if I'm looking to fill a gap in the industry um, in terms of accessibility as well. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the question there was, did I have to kind of make any, I guess, concessions to to kind of like my research interests with, with the industry research interest? And I, I think the answer there was like, that was precisely the reason we had this kind of like split track, where I wasn't really expecting them to take uh, the insights from a thematic analysis and like a 15,000 word paper um into into their game development environment and wait a year for the results as well I wasn't expecting them to take that so it was more that to be honest with you it's more that I was flexible around what they needed so that's why I designed this extra track I designed this extra kind of step stage of reporting and things like that to kind of feed insight back to them that was valuable um I wouldn't I can't think of anything where they um where there are any concessions made or anything like that I think if it wasn't a game that was off the shelf, then it would be more of an issue with NDAs and things like that. And it, it might be more concerning as what I'm doing, because I was sending this to people's homes to, to run a, a piece of research. Um, and I wasn't concerned about security in this case, because it was a game that was off the shelf, I didn't need to be. And that had benefits in terms of running this as a natural piece of research. If I was running this as a study that was uh, running a game that was a game in development or a game they were just releasing, then there'd be more concerns around that kind of thing. And there might be more concessions, but that was precisely why I was inclined to choose a game off the shelf rather than something that was in development and, and try and find a partner that would allow that research to happen in collaboration with industry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Um, I'll just repeat the question quickly. So it was the idea that that the the kind of longer academic report that I produced, uh, was it worthwhile, even though I produced this uh, kind of industry suited report, would it be also worthwhile them going back and, and reading the kind of longer industry report as well? I think I, ideally, yes, there would be, there would be value in them doing that. But obviously, um, most developers don't inherently as part of their workflow engage with academic research. And if if they wanted to, then it was there. I did make it available to them. Um, I sent the report over to um, the studio and people that were related to it as well. So I sent it over to Xbox as well. Um, and they were welcome to read that too. I think there is insight that's more, I guess, like generally useful in there in terms of how you would adapt the design of games and kind of how you're thinking about things around designing games more broadly as well. Because obviously the, the industry report is more actionable for you know the if you're making uh, a strategy game if you're making gears tactics then it's useful to you um but if, if not then then it has it has less value so you can take those more transferable insights i suppose the thing there as well would be that i i am personally seeking to kind of work in the industry improving accessibility so it helps me to understand these things too which i then will work with people and help them understand those things from that academic background as well so i find it unlikely that most people would read that academic um body of research but it's something that improved my knowledge a lot as well 
and people in the academic space too that do do read those papers and when I engage with developers wherever possible, it's something that I will build into kind of how I'm communicating around accessibility and things like that to help them improve their work. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the start of the question? I didn't catch a word. No, it's okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if there are any kind of challenges in kind of translating the insights from my research to the industry. So I guess one of the reasons I chose the kind of reporting style that I chose was because, so for the industry report in particular, I knew that they were familiar seeing reports like that already. I, I knew that they had received reports, reports like that from uh, user researchers, um, and they would be familiar with interpreting that style of report, basically. So, so that, I guess, made it much less challenging um, because it was already a method that they were familiar with. But, I mean, there were challenges with that too, though, because uh, not everyone is going to, to even read a report that gets passed around. So that's also why um, it was engaged with via a talk as well, so a, a talk to the studio as a whole, but also particular teams that were involved in, in the previous product that it would be relevant to, basically. Um, and then we also ran workshops as well, which kind of distilled uh, it distilled the kind of insights here down to kind of player personas and got them thinking about kind of how they might extract them into different environments and things like that as well. Yeah. Anyone have any other questions? Cool. I think that's, that's everything then. Uh, thanks very much for attending the talk and listening to me for 50 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.